I will quote my favorite Scottish professor. Pike up your kilts, gentlemen. We're going to run today. We've got a lot to do. And so let's dive into God's Word and see where He takes us today. Amen? Amen. Okay. I secretly kind of want to be Braveheart someday. (laughs) This is Mother's Day, and yet, moms, it's going to feel a little unusual as we start this message today, as we're in this passage in Matthew 11, because it's not going to feel at first like this is a real geared for moms kind of message. You know, a lot of times pastors will prepare specifically for a Father's Day or a Mother's Day message, and yet you're going to see when you wait for it, as we get closer to the end of this message, you're going to see that this is really all about you in a very specific way. So I just ask you to be patient, watch to see how this is going to apply to you, because I promise you it will. Matthew 11, starting at verse 16. To what can I compare this generation? Who's speaking? Jesus. They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to others. Remember that the controversy is starting to heat up. Jesus has been doing, has been doing loads of miracles. He went across to the east side of the Sea of Galilee, that lake, and he did some miracles over there in Gentile territory. Then he came back across to Capernaum in the area on the west side, which is more of a Jewish territory. And now he's starting to speak to crowds, and the controversies are building because as he gets closer and closer to the fulfillment of his earthly mission, some people aren't going to like that very much, especially the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So he says to these people, what can I compare this generation? They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to others. And they say, and he's using a quote, we think, from their culture, something they would be familiar with that we're not. I'll explain it in just a second. He says, we played the pipe for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. And in English, we would say, okay. (laughs) But he's using an illustration about children in the marketplace. First of all, you have to know about the marketplace. That was a place where everything was happening. You can see on some of these... uh, TV shows like The Amazing Race, where people will go to a big outdoor marketplace, and there are colors, and people shouting, hawking their wares. Some people will say, come and buy my tomatoes, and other people will be over here in this area talking philosophy. Some people would be over in this corner of the marketplace talking politics. It was a place where everybody gathered. That's why the Apostle Paul liked to hang out in the marketplace, because he could gather a crowd there. And when he starts speaking in the Areopagus and other places that were public in nature, When he started talking about this man who had died and come back to life, well, you can gather a whole bunch of people in a marketplace like that. So this is the setting, and Jesus may have actually been teaching in a setting very much like that. He had a way of grabbing something mundane and common and making it uncommon by using it for his illustrations. Then he says, Jesus is comparing his generation to these immature children. Now, you know what it's like to pretend. Uh, I I love watching smaller children around. Some of you in the preschool department have seen it every week. One kid will start giving instructions. It's usually the firstborn. (laughs) And they'll be the one saying to the other one, okay, we're going to play, and then fill in the blank, whatever they're going to play. You know, like we're going to play bake something in the oven. So you say, and they start telling the other kid what they're supposed to say and do. And then if they're getting into that, they'll say, okay, and they start pretending, and they go into this big pretend mode. Well, back in Jesus' day, children were still children. They did that stuff. So he's saying, basically, let's play wedding. They would play a flute at a wedding or at a celebration. It was more of like a wooden flute, so they called it a pipe in some translations that you've got. So they're saying, let's play wedding. I'll play the pipe, and you dance, okay? And he says, you guys, this generation, you're like those children that just got up on the wrong side of the bed. You can't get them to get engaged for nothing because they sit there with their arms crossed, and they just look at you like, I don't want to. And he says, okay, well, if you don't want to play wedding, let's play funeral. I'll sing the dirge, and you mourn and wail, okay? Because they're imitating what they see being done by the adults in their lives. And, and so they start to sing a dirge. Whatever the dirge is. And they're saying, now you wail, go for it. And they go, I don't want to. And he says, you're just like those spoiled brat children. You can't get engaged in anything. I played the pipe for you. You didn't dance. I sang the dirge. You didn't mourn. The people had heard John's message and Jesus' message, and you couldn't get them engaged for nothing. 
many of these people. They wanted to see the spectacle. They wanted to show up if he was going to break bread and pass it out and and feed 5,000 people. They wanted to see the spectacle of a miracle being done, and he'd done a bunch of them. But to get engaged and to start heeding the signs that he's giving them, they weren't there. They were like, no, I don't want to. So what about our generation? Could this apply today? How many times have the same messages been propagated, especially in America? And we get a lot of people that some are just plain antagonistic to the message. They don't want to hear it at all. And those who do want to hear it, very many, they'll listen to it. They want the spectacle. They want the miracles. But they sit with their arms crossed and they say, I don't want to. Now, through creation itself, We've come to see already in just these first 10 and now 11th chapters in Matthew that creation itself reveals that God is who he is and that he has a specific task to do. He's given us the specific written word, his inspired, divinely inspired written word, and he sent us the person of Jesus Christ, the ultimate word, the word who became flesh. So in all these ways, God has revealed in no uncertain terms, I'm here, I made all this for you. I want a relationship with you. You blew it because of sin, but I want to make a way to come back to me. And so he provides Jesus. He's revealed his plan of redemption, including the atonement, and yet so many people just want to do whatever they want to do. And so they really don't want to play nicely with God. Even though there's plenty of opportunities for them to hear and respond, they don't. Many listen, but few receive. Some people could say, oh, yes, but I'm a nice person. I'm tolerant. I'll accept you even though you don't believe exactly the way I do. It's good that that religion stuff works for you. That's great. Good for you. We're going to see in just a minute where Jesus takes people like that to task in Chorazin and Bethsaida and in Capernaum. John came, neither eating nor drinking, Jesus says, and they say, oh, he has a demon. And the Son of Man came, that's his favorite term for himself, eating and drinking, and they say, oh, he's a glutton and a drunkard. He's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And then he says, but wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Let's look at that for just a moment. Oops, I just hit the wrong button again. Again, I have one job. (laughs) I can't even get my right thumb to go on the right button. Okay, just put a piece of tape over that other button there, would you? (laughs) Wisdom is proved right by her deeds. We're going to look at what that means in just a second. Same evidence, different conclusions. You know how people can do that. You see it all the time. That's what they did with John the Baptist and with Jesus. It happened when I saw a bunch of trees that were knocked over in Roscommon years ago. We were driving up for a men's retreat at Bambi Lake near Roscommon, and we were driving down one highway near St. Helens, and there was a whole row of trees that just looked like somebody had just gone and just uprooted them and knocked them all over. And I said, oh, look, it must have been either a small tornado or a straight-line wind because I'm kind of a meteorologist. No, it's, it's because the evidence seemed pretty obvious. But you could get somebody else who could look at that same row of trees knocked over, and they would say, well, I, uh, I've been to school a lot. And I can tell you why these trees are knocked over. It's because a herd of elephants came through here, and they stampeded those trees down. And we would look at them as if they're from Mars, and we would say, that's absurd. We don't have any elephants around here. And he says, well... I don't think you've studied the same things I've studied. (laughs) And in some cases, we would think that's totally absurd, and that's kind of what Jesus is saying. He was saying, we've given you so much evidence, it was so obvious, it should be so obvious to you, and yet we've come up with wildly different conclusions. They found a way to dismiss both John the Baptist and his message, and Jesus and his message. They're saying, okay, well, John must have a demon because he's a crazy man. He's dressing crazily, and he eats locusts and wild honey. And he doesn't eat and drink with the rest of us like normal people do. And so they dismiss him by the way they describe him. And yet Jesus comes, an incarnational God, literally. God made in the flesh so that we can truly know what God is like. He does eat with them. He does drink with them. And they say, oh, he's a glutton and a drunkard. You see what they're doing? Same evidence, but they come with wildly different conclusions. And then he ends with this observation. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Simply put, proof is in the pudding. Or by their fruit, you will know them. He says, you just watch John, and it'll play out. Wisdom will become evident. You just watch me. Wisdom will become evident. And so he's saying, you just watch us, both John and me, and you're going to see wisdom fleshed out.
And then he offers some sobering words of grief and distress. That word woe, the the woes that he offers to these cities, it's a strong, uh, almost rip your clothing with grief kind of feeling that he's putting along with that, saying, I have such distress over this. Woe to you. How terrible for you. That's what this woe means in these unrepentant towns. Starting in verse 20. He began to denounce the towns in which most of these miracles had been performed. Because they did not repent, even though they had seen all these signs. So here's the principle, first of all, that Jesus gives us. The more light someone rejects, the greater their judgment. The more light someone rejects, the greater their judgment. We're going to see this in Chorazin and Bethsaida and in Capernaum. Some have a lot of light. You know, the trees are knocked down. Obviously, there was a storm last week. We saw the radar. The evidence is great, and yet they choose to believe that elephants did it. (laughs) Some have a little bit, and yet their ability to see a little bit and want more is rewarded by God. Some saw miracles, and yet they call Jesus a glutton and a drunkard. He says, woe to you. How awful, how horrible for you. And I can almost picture Jesus saying this not so much with anger, but with sadness and grief in his heart. Heartbroken for them. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Let me give you a list of cities so you can see some comparisons. Let's march back in time and say that Ypsilanti would be Capernaum. This is where Jesus made his home. Aren't you glad to know that we live where Jesus made his home? (laughs) Fantastic. I, I would pray that God is making his home here in Ypsilanti right now. And he can through you all, because he lives in each of you who are believers, and so you have an influence in Ypsilanti. So you're like Capernaum in that regard. Chorazin is more like Milan. These are more like villages. They're not huge cities, but they called them cities back then, and we call Milan a city. Belleville, nice place, a little bit farther away, but not too far, and we like them. They're good, except when we play baseball with them. (laughs) Tyre, however, is Ann Arbor, and Sidon would be Selene. And in those days, they would have the same kinds of uh, stigmas that people would cast out on people, and they would kind of stick, just like today. We have certain prejudices that if you listen, you keep your ear to the ground, people will tell you things about these places. For example, here in Ypsilanti, we're grassroots people. We grew up making bombers back in World War II. You know, Rosie the Riveter came from Ypsilanti. We are good folks, hardworking folks. But, you know, Ann Arbor. I don't know. They're kind of liberal out there in Ann Arbor. Uh, Out here in the country, we kind of vote Republican. Not so sure about some of you, but, you know, (laughs) there are all these stigmas that we put on these towns. They were like that. Sidon would be like Celine. They would say, yeah, they're a little bit uppity. (laughs) Those Selenites, you got to watch out for those Selenites. They have their nose just a little bit higher in the air than some of us. And then Sodom would be like Las Vegas, you know, Sin City, literally. And Gomorrah would be like a twin sister city that's like Las Vegas, but uh, they had more to do with different kinds of decadence. And so we've got Hollywood, things like that in Los Angeles. So that's kind of an idea of where Jesus is coming from when he's giving these analogies, okay? So Chorazin and Bethsaida near Capernaum had witnessed all these miracles that Jesus had been doing, and yet they just kept on living their lives, thinking that they were respectable people. And you have to say it with a rolled R, respectable, because they're comparing themselves to other places. And yet, Jesus makes another comparison because they say, yeah, but Tyre and Sidon, they would not be considered respectable. They were in Phoenicia, and when you talk about Phoenicians, when you read about the Phoenicians, (laughs) oh my, seaport cities in Phoenicia, the heart of Canaanite country. In fact, Tyre was the capital of the Canaanite people, and they were despicable. They had Baal worship, idol worship. Think of that as a port city where there's lots of sailors coming in with lots of money in their pockets and lots of time to spend it and plenty of vices to spend it on. You get the picture. Of course, in Bethsaida, by comparison with Tyre and Sidon, would be considered nice people. We're good people. We're good cities. And Yet Jesus says, if miracles that were performed in Chorazin and Bethsaida had been performed in those despicable cities of Tyre and Sidon, those people in Tyre and Sidon would have repented a long time ago. You see these comparisons that he's making now? And I think he's trying to speak to the heart of the issue that we can be really nice folks 
And we cannot be under God's blessing because we fail to recognize his authority. If the miracles performed in Milan and Belleville had been performed in Ann Arbor, that liberal place, and Selene, those uppity people, and the people in Ann Arbor and Selene would have repented a long time ago. Happens today. Here's two important truths. There will be a judgment. Just count on it. I went on the internet and found good old Robert G. Lee's sermon, Payday Someday. He preached that over a thousand times, and it became his hallmark message. There's going to be a payday someday. And he says, one thing we've got to remember is, and I can't Im- imitate his voice. He's got this great southern accent that I just can't pull, up, pull out of me. But he was saying that the devil always pays in counterfeit money. There's going to be a, a payday someday, but you don't want to be paid by the devil. You want to be paid by the one who gives the real thing. And it's just so cool to see how he paints that picture. People responded in droves because he said there will be a judgment. And the Bible clearly says that. Maybe not immediately. That's something that John might have missed as he's in prison because he spoke out against Herod, Antipas. And Herod had him thrown into prison. He's about to be beheaded, as we know from reading ahead a little bit. So it might not come in time to get John out of prison, but there will be a payday someday. Second, we learn that there will be a different degree of judgment for those who had plenty of light and yet chose to reject it. Here's something I think, I read this from another pastor, and I had to think about it. I said, do I really believe this? Is this true? And when you read through this whole passage, I think, you know, I I think that's the right way to put it. I think it's true. The hottest places in hell, you know, sometimes you'd say, man, they're going to have a special place in hell reserved for that person. Normally, because we think of the despicable, heinous crime that they've committed, the hottest place in hell is going to be reserved for people like that. Well, I don't think so. According to this passage, the hottest places in hell will not be reserved for those who committed the worst sins, but for those who rejected the most light. Sobering thought, isn't it? Because it's easy for us to find ourselves looking pretty good in comparison with those Phoenician cities or with Sodom or Gomorrah or Los Angeles or Las Vegas, and yet we can still be just as far away from God's blessing because we're not under His authority. To whom much is given, much is required. It's a biblical principle. It's a similar principle to what we're seeing here. Chorazin, Bethsaida, you've been given great light. Therefore, what would we say? They have a lot of responsibility because to whom much is given, much is required. But I tell you, Jesus says, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. Wow. Some kind of comparison. He asks, And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? Uh Uh-oh, he's gotten to Ypsilanti. (laughs) Will you be lifted to the heavens? Do you think you're so good that suddenly you should be ushered in, that your names should be written in the Lamb's Book of Life just because you're nice people? Look at all the stuff that Jesus had done in Capernaum. All those miracles that we've been studying. He raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He cast out demons over on the east side of the lake. He healed a nobleman's son. He healed Peter's mother-in-law, just a touch. Boom. He healed a man who couldn't speak and gave him speech. He gave sight to two blind men. He healed a paralyzed man whose friends had brought him and let him down through the roof. Remember that? He healed a woman who had been hemorrhaging for 12 years. All that he had done in public and in the size of a place like Capernaum, the way news traveled, there could not have been anybody in that region who would have not heard about Jesus and his miracles. Not one. The people of Capernaum were privileged because they had seen God's power at work, and yet they refused to accept his authority. That's why Jesus answered his own question. Should you be lifted up to heaven? No. It's one of those questions that assumes a no answer, but he goes ahead and answers it anyway. It would be like us saying, so is uh, Michigan a nice, warm, balmy place to visit in February? no. And he answers that, no, you will go down to Hades. We're a lot like Capernaum and Chorazin and Bethsaida. How many opportunities have we had freely given to us to be able to embrace the truth? The light has been shining in this area, and there's still so many, however, that would say, well, I'm a good person. I'm tolerant of other people, but they will not submit to the authority of Jesus Christ, God's Son. He says, for the miracles that were performed in you, Capernaum, If they'd been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. You remember what happened with Sodom? Completely destroyed by fire from above. 
But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. It's huge comparisons. Another way to say it. Capernaum, you think Sodom had it bad? If you don't repent, you ain't seen nothing yet. Some people will receive abundant blessings from God. And they'll say, you know, we live in this wonderful country and we're such a God-blessed country. And they used to sing, God bless America in schools. And we would salute the flag and have, you know, in God we trust on all of our coinage. And they would say, we receive so many blessings from God. We're a Christian country. And I would have to join many others in saying, we're so far from being a Christian country. So far, we're, we're not just post-Christian, we're post-modern, we're post-everything. God is going to mete out punishment, and it's going to be just punishment because He is a just God if people fail to recognize His authority. What about America? What about us? If we don't repent after being exposed to such great light, God's going to have to apologize to Sodom for not judging us. Here's where, moms, it starts to come back to you. We need a revival We need a spiritual renewal in this country. And it's got to start with the remnant, just like it did in Israel. It's always been a remnant. And guess what, moms? That's where you come in. You have the greatest influence of anybody in the country on the next generation of kids. And it's up to you to help set that stage. And I know many of you are, and we're so proud of you for that. And it's a tough job. You know, they bring home all the bugs from the school kids that they've got, and you've got to put up with them. My daughter in South Carolina has a little three-year-old who's got a fever this morning, so she couldn't go to church. It's tough work. I mean, it's parenting in the trenches, especially when they're young. God bless you for hanging in there. Keep doing it. Keep raising your kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Keep bringing them into places like this so they can learn about God and His love. Keep surrounding you and others around you with the kind of support you need from people who do follow Christ and want to honor Him. You have so much influence, and we're so grateful for you. And so I want to wrap this up by saying that this really all points to you because, moms, God has appointed you to have the most important job in the world. And we want you to know that you're supported and cared for and prayed for, and we love you. So let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for these moms who have such a vital role. We thank you for all those moms that we mentioned earlier who have been moms to people even though they might have been surrogate moms or uh, sort of adopted, in quotes, moms. We thank you, Father, for all the ways that you have surrounded us with the right kind of influences so that we can point our children to the most important things, those things that will last forever. And I pray that that will be the case. I pray that this will be a nurturing, loving compassionate body of Christ that welcomes people and shows them the way and shows them that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life and that no one comes to the Father except through Him so that they can make the right choices in life by following Jesus and as a Jesus follower to be light and salt to all those people around us starting right here in Capernaum or Ypsilanti (laughs) and we thank you Father that your word is still so relevant to us I pray that if we need to repent for being nice people, that we'll do that. And that we'll turn to you and say, it's not just being nice that's going to be good enough. We need to fully follow Jesus Christ as a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And I pray these things in the name and the authority and the power of Jesus, who made all this possible. Amen.